You're listening to a sermon from Oak Hill Fellowship Church, located in Strasburg, Pennsylvania. You can learn more about us by visiting oakhillfellowship.com or finding us on social media. Now grab a Bible, a notebook, and get ready to be spiritually enriched by the Word of God. You can open your Bibles to Judges chapter 4. Judges chapter 4 this morning. And as you're turning there, I want you to consider this question. What is that thing that God has called you to do that you don't really want to do right now? What what is the thing that God is calling you to do that you don't really want to do right now? Now, maybe when I ask you that question, your first thought is actually something along these lines. Like, I don't even really understand the question, Pastor Ben. Because I don't, I don't really think that God is calling me to do anything. I'm not, I'm not in, you know, vocational ministry or something like that. I, I, I'm, I don't understand what calling you're talking about. And I, I get that. We've, we've kind of mystified this idea of calling in our culture. Uh, but really, calling is simply obeying everything that Jesus commanded us to do in his word. Right, like that's the Great Commission, that we're to make disciples, and that part of making disciples is to teach them to obey all that Christ commanded. And so our calling is simply applying God's word to whatever situation of life we find ourselves. In your family, and in your work, and in our church, and in your individual life. And so maybe it's something that God has revealed to you in His word in just a private time in his word, maybe in your quiet time in the morning or something like that. You've maybe, uh, maybe it's something that you've heard preached and you're like, yes, I need to apply that. And yet you don't really feel like applying that. And so you're slow in applying that or you haven't done it yet. Or maybe if you've been around Oak Hill for a few months, you you took our purposeful discipleship pathway self assessment. And that's a tool that we've used here at Oak Hill and we are continuing to use. You can get it on our website right now uh, that that is meant to uh, direct you to God's calling in your life in many different spheres so that you can understand how to take the next step. And maybe you're like, yeah, I see uh, what God is calling me to do there, but I'm reluctant in taking that step. So maybe it's a, a sin habit in your life that you're, you're kind of scared of letting go because you, you want to get rid of it. You know you should get rid of it, but, but this sin habit has existed in your life for so long that you don't even know what your life would be like without it. Maybe God is calling you to uh, open up more during our mutual ministry time in gospel communities. That's that time where we're, we're seeking to confess sinful patterns or temptations or weaknesses in some area. And you know that that would help you grow, but that requires vulnerability. And it can be uncomfortable or, or scary at times. Maybe it's just the idea of committing to a gospel community in the first place, even, even visiting one or joining one. That, that would mean getting into some new relationships, which you know can be messy. It would mean reordering your priorities and your time. And to be honest, you just don't, you just don't feel like it sometimes. Perhaps God is calling you to intentionally disciple someone who is younger in the faith. And, and that seems overwhelming to you. Or maybe you are that person who is younger in the faith and you know you need to ask someone to disciple you. You know you need that in your life. You know you have benefited from that in your life, but you're afraid of them rejecting you. Maybe you have a neighbor that that God wants you to share Jesus with, but the idea of walking across the street and starting the conversation terrifies you. Or maybe it's a fear of commitment. Maybe it's a fear of committing to membership at our church or some other church. Perhaps God is calling you to serve in ministry or to step into leadership in some way and you're scared of what that will cost you. Do you you have it in your mind right now? What is it for you? What is God calling you to do that you don't really want to do right now? And the reality is that there are so many things that can keep us from doing what God is calling us to do in our lives. Fear, 
self-protectiveness, emotional scars, selfishness. And if we're going to take the next step in his call on our lives, we're going to need godly resolve. Taking our next steps of faith, taking our next steps in the way of a disciple requires godly resolve. And so the title of today's sermon is A Call for Godly Resolve. Because the truth is that resolve can be hard to come by sometimes in the church. And resolve is absolutely essential to following Jesus. Now, when I say godly resolve, I want you to understand what I mean because I'm going to say it a lot during this sermon. I mean a decisiveness to do God's will. I mean courage and motivation in taking my next steps of faith. I mean a spirit-empowered grit and perseverance when the going gets tough in my life. And so if we're going to take the next step in God's call in our lives, we are going to need that kind of godly resolve. In fact, I would suggest that if your version of the Christian walk does not require resolve, then it's not Christ who you are following. If your version of the Christian life, you say you're a Christian, and you're like, yeah, but it doesn't really require anything of me. I don't, I, don't, I don't need any kind of resolve. It's just kind of coasting through life. If your version of the Christian life does not require godly resolve, then you are not walking with Christ. You see, we need to understand that the Christian life is a very real spiritual battle. The Christian life is not a picnic. It's a battle. It's a battle for our souls. It's a battle for the souls of the men and women in us. And if we're not picking up that battle and entering into it with resolve, then it's not the Christian life that we're living. And so in this sermon series, we are learning how to seek God for that resolve. How to seek God for that rescue. We're learning how to seek God's merciful rescue to break the cycles of our rebellious sin. Seek God's merciful rescue to break the cycles of our rebellious sin. And that requires that we wage an all-out war on the powers of darkness in the power of the Spirit who indwells us. And that can be hard because our enemy is very sneaky, right? Like if he can't catch us in some habitual sin or some doing things that that we know that we aren't supposed to do, but we just want to do anyway, like if Satan can't trap us in those types of sin patterns, he's going to sideline us with fear and distraction and complacency and selfishness. See, sin cycles are not just about doing things that we know we are not supposed to do, Sin cycles are also about not doing the things that God has called us to do. Not taking those next steps of following Jesus. We call it sins of commission, things that we know we aren't supposed to do and yet we do. And sins of omission, things that we don't do that God has called us to do. We need godly resolve to enter the battle and to break all those cycles of sin in our lives. You need to be thinking about all of that when we're going through this series. And so today, from the experience of Deborah and Barak, we're going we're gonna to see how God uses his people to produce the resolve we need. He uses his people around us to produce the resolve that we need. And so here's our big idea for today. Uh, your resolved participation in God's battle will influence the resolve of the people around you. Your resolved participation in God's battle will influence the resolve of the people around you. Your Bibles are open to Judges chapter 4, and we're going to cover all of chapter 4 and chapter 5 today, which sounds like a lot, I understand, but we're going to move pretty quickly through it. And so uh, just to catch you up to speed on the context of the book of Judges and where we're at right now, Judges spans the entire period of time between the death of Joshua and the beginning of the rise of the monarchy in Israel, where the kings started to reign in Israel. And so Joshua first led the people of Israel to 
conquer the land of Canaan, which was God's promised land to them. And, and, and so Joshua's generation did that, but then in the second generation, uh, complacency and compromise began to creep in And so they were supposed to devote the inhabitants of Canaan to destruction. Uh, The Canaanites deserved that for their idolatry. And and as well, God knew that if the Israelites did not rid the land of these idolatrous people, then they themselves would enter into that idolatry. God knew that the hearts of his people were just as sinful as the Canaanites. And so he needed them to fight this battle. He wanted them to fight this battle. But Israel did not do what God called them to do. And surprise, surprise, by the third generation, we moved beyond compromise now to full-on corruption. And the people of Israel to start worshiping the Baals and the Asherah, the idols of the peoples of Canaan. And so the cycles of rebellion and rescue begin. We've seen three of those cycles so far in this book, maybe two and a half, depending on how you measure it. But Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They rebelled against God. And so God gave them uh, Kushan Rishathaim, the king of Mesopotamia. His His name means Kushan double evil. That was the consequence of their sin. And so they cried out to the Lord, uh, whether it's in regret or repentance, we don't really know, but the Lord had mercy on them. He raised up Othniel as their deliverer, as their rescuer. And the land had rest for 40 years. But during that time, Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They rebelled, and so God gave them Eglon. You remember Eglon, right? Remember Jabba the Hutt, right? And and, and he was the king of the Moabites, and and he delivered Israel into his hands as their consequence. And they cried out, again, in either regret or repentance, we don't know, but uh, God had mercy upon them, and he raised up Ehud as their deliverer. And the land had rest for 80 years that time. Then we get this little note about a a guy named Shamgar. Shamgar had defeated 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Remember Jackie Chan, right? And and so it it seems that Shamgar was a judge during the time that we are studying today. Shamgar was a judge during the time of Deborah being a judge. And that brings us up to speed in chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to take this section by section uh, through chapter 5 today to see the necessity of godly resolve. And so look at chapter 4, verse 1. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagoyim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron. He oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord of the God of Israel commanded you? Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went with him. Now Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak of Zenanim, which is near Kadesh. 
When, his, when Sisera had told, was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him, from Harosheth Hagoyim to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harasheth Hagoyim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. Your resolved participation in God's battle will influence the resolve of the people around you. Today we're going to see three ways that we participate in God's battle with godly resolve. And then three ways that that influences the people around us. So three ways that we participate in God's battle with resolve and three ways that that influences the people around us. And the first is this, your resolved presence influences others to enter God's battle. Your resolved presence, that's your participation, influences others to enter God's battle. So verses one through five set the scene for us. The rebellion and rescue cycle are taking another spin around the circle. Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They, they took that season of testing and peace during the 80 years after Eglon's defeat, and, and they used it to give themselves over to idolatry again. It's evil. And so God raised up Jabin, the king of Hazor. Now, Jabin, king of Hazor, is, a, is the name also of another powerful king who we read about in Joshua chapter 11. And, and that causes some confusion for people who are trying to study the book of Judges deeply. And they're like, wait a minute, we've already read about Jabin, the king of Hazor, back in Joshua 11. And back there, Joshua had annihilated Jabin, had annihilated his city. The whole city was devoted to destruction. It did not exist anymore. So how do we have Jabin, king of Hazor, in Judges chapter 4? And likely, something like this is what happened. This Jabin king of Hazor guy was receiving the oral tradition of his people. And he, he heard about this Jabin guy from the past who was a good military leader, who, who was a very strong organizer of the peoples of Canaan. And he thinks to himself, you know what? If I associate myself with this guy from our common ancestry... I can probably gain some military strength here. I can gain some things for myself in the process. And that's actually what happens. He, he unites the peoples of Canaan that lived in this area of Hazor. He, he brings them together, and they do gain strong military strength. They, they build 900 chariots of iron, it, that's kind of like having 900 Sherman tanks in World War II. If you want to think about military power, just how powerful this guy was. And so he finds himself, as, uh, he finds himself a commander of his army, a Sisera. Sisera was a mercenary. He was probably from the land of Philistia. He's a, a hired killer. A hired mercenary. And he begins to oppress the Israelites for 20 years. So just let me recap this for you so that you really understand the importance of the narrative that's being set up here. Jabin, king of Hazor, is the remnants of an evil but already defeated foe who is trying to get back what he has already lost. Now, I hope that sounds familiar. 
Jabin has some temporary success, but in the grand scheme of things, his time is short. God is going to bring his reign to a decisive end. And so before we get into uh, the part of the story where he comes to an end, I want to point out how our battle is similar here. Because according to Ephesians 6, we fight real, evil rulers and authorities who wage war against our souls. They've been defeated through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They one day will finally be dealt with at the final judgment. But in the present, they're trying to regain whatever little power that they can before they face their ultimate end. Do you see the similarities? And I want you to know, like, I'm not allegorizing this here. Jabin and Sisera were real evil rulers who inflicted real harm on God's people at a point in history. But the schemes of the devil and the powers of darkness that stood behind those real historical figures are the same ones that we face today. This is real. We, friends, are in a real spiritual battle. Our society and culture is entrenched in cycles of idolatry and sin. They're enslaved under the domain of darkness. And maybe you are still entrenched even in those same cycles of idolatry and sin. And the enemy of our souls fights hard against us. He, he, he wants to take us down along with any of the people around us. But God has called his church to enter into battle. God has called his church to enter into battle. And Jesus promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against the offensive attack of the church. What we are doing this morning here is not some cute little tradition. This is battle, friends. This is battle. You, you might be sitting in a pew, but you are doing battle against the powerful schemes of the enemy as you are listening to the word of God poured out over you. Don't minimize that in your heart. Don't minimize that in your life of how much you need that. This is battle. And yet often we're timid about the battle. Sometimes we're unsure if we want to or even should take part in it. And so God gives his church spirit-filled leaders to remind him of his presence with them. God was going to be with Israel in their battle against Jabin and Sisera. They would be reminded of his presence through a godly leader named Deborah a godly woman with godly resolve. And so Deborah is the judge at this time in history. She would sit under the palm tree and, and settle the national disputes of Israel. So a lot of times I think we think about this like, like two guys come up with their, you know, a little land dispute about where their property line is and she'd settle that. No, this is more like the situation room of the White House. She's, she's settling the national disputes, the big things that are, are, are plaguing Israel at the time, and there was a lot of them. And so this is a wise, godly, national leader to whom God speaks. She's called a prophetess. She hears the word of the Lord under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and so she receives a prophecy one day. There's a guy named Barak out in the tribe of Naphtali who is supposed to assemble 10,000 troops because the Lord is going to deliver Sisera the Canaanite into his hands. And that's great news after 20 years of oppression, isn't it? That's great news. And so she summons up Barak, and, and Barak is like less than confident. Look at verse 8 again. Barak, Barak said to her, if, you, if you'll go with me, I'll go. But, but, if, but if you don't go with me, I'm, I'm not going to go. I, I can't go without you. Not exactly the poster boy for Resolve magazine, is he? 
Like, like here's this would-be general who's basically saying, if you hold my hand the whole way, I'll go do what God is telling me to do. Now, there's a lot of cultural dynamics at play here in the writing of the story, and we have, to, we have to grapple with them a little bit, okay? So on the one hand, this story is a celebration of the value of women in the people of God. De- Deborah is a godly and gifted woman who the Lord uses mightily in his plan. And she upends the typical view of women that was held in the culture of that day, that women were less than in value and skill. And on the other hand, the the cultural view is still in play within the story. The story is wrestling with these things because the readers and even Barak would have seen this as a shameful request. Like It's likely that Barak felt some shame in his unwillingness to go and in his needing to make this request as a general. In fact, Deborah acknowledges that shame when she says, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, but the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. In other words, God is going to use what the culture deems as weak. God is going to use what the culture deems as less than to shame the strong. That's the major theme in the book of Judges or a major theme. The Bible is not agreeing necessarily with the assessment that women are less than or lack certain skills. The Bible is very clear all throughout that women are equal in value while different in responsibility that the Lord has given them. Equal in value, different in responsibility. But God is using the cultural idea of the woman's less than status to make sure that he gets all the glory. Notice, Barak doesn't get the glory, but neither will the woman. We're going to see that later. In in the end, it's going to be the Lord who gets the glory. He uses the things that are considered weak in our culture, scared generals, and those who are culturally less than to shame the strong, to show that the all-surpassing worth belongs to the Lord. But here's what I find interesting. Barak shows a severe lack of resolve. He shows a hesitation in his willingness to obey God. But instead of Deborah saying, you know what, fine then, I'm going to find someone else. Or instead of Deborah saying, you know what, fine then, I'll go do it myself. She says, surely I will go with you. Surely I will go with you. That that is so spirit-filled. That is so merciful and kind. Deborah's resolve has a profound influence on Barak's resolve. Her resolved presence influences Barak to enter the battle. It's true that Barak only needed the Lord's presence to win the victory. But listen, he needed Deborah's presence to even get to the battle. He needed to hear the words, the Lord is with you. He needed her flesh and blood reminder of the Lord's spiritual presence with him. And so here's this woman who who hears from God. She's a prophetess. She is one through whom the Spirit of God speaks, and she's going to be the flesh and blood reminder of God's presence as Barak enters into the battle. Now, Now, before we throw too much shade on Barak, can we just admit Like, how many times have you ever needed someone to hold your hand in order to do what the Lord is calling you to do? Be honest with yourself. How many times have you ever needed someone to hold your hand in order to do what the Lord is calling you to do? I'll be honest, I'm like Barack all the time. And Katie's my Deborah. I told her that this week, and she's like, just call me Little Debbie. (laughs) But far too often, I'm like, like, I don't really know if I feel like fighting the battle today. 
I don't, I don't really know if it's worth it. I don't really know if I can do it. And it's, it's just a lot easier to give in to my fleshly desires. And it's a lot easier to distract myself with other things than to do what the Lord is calling me to do. And, and in the comforts of my home, even sometimes I'll verbalize these things to my own shame. And in comes this godly, spirit-filled woman who looks at me and says, the Lord is with you, and I am with you. Sometimes she'll say it this way. She says, I'm on Team Ben. And hearing those words, it's like a breath of fresh air in my soul. Not because I know I need her, but because I know that she's going to point me to the Lord's presence, which is what I ultimately need. Spouses, listen, be that for each other. Be that for each other. Sometimes for me, this also has to come from the elders. Uh, sometimes it comes from my gospel community. Sometimes it comes from other pastors who I need to call up. Listen, I'm telling you, it takes an army to get me going sometimes. And I'll, I'll gladly boast in that weakness because it shows that the power of God is not in me. It's, in, it's God. The power is not in me. It's God. God allows for us to need others to enter the battle with us. In fact, he's, he's given us the church specifically for that reason. That, he would, that we would lock arms with one another and wage war against the domain of darkness together. He's not given us the church so that a select few could go into the battle and do all the fighting for us and the rest of us could sit by on the sidelines and be consumers. He wants us all to get in the battle. And some will choose not to. We'll, we'll see in chapter 5, some will choose not to do that to their own shame. But many will choose to join. And so, so Deborah goes and she provides this resolved presence for Barak and he collects his 10,000 troops. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we get this little story about Heber the Kenite and the Kenites who were the descendants of Moses' father-in-law. And we're like, what in the world is going on here? The story is relevant for something that we haven't read yet. But Heber has separated himself from the people of Israel. He's the one trying to sit on the sideline to wait this whole thing out, to watch the power struggle between these two nations. He's made an alliance kind of with both sides. He's hedging his bets, which is treason, by the way. Like, let's not call it anything less than it is. It's total treason. It's terrible. It's treacherous. It's evil. And then after we hear about him, we return to the battle scene. The mercenary general Sisera somehow hears about these 10,000 troops. And so he musters all 900 of his chariots, all, all of the fighting men that he can find, and, and, and he's going he's to squash them down like he's done for the 20 years prior. This is the showdown. And again, Barak freezes. He freezes. And Deborah has to encourage Barak up again in the moment of the battle now. She's like, up, up, bud, come on. Get up. The Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go before you? That's resolved presence. She doesn't give up on Barak. She directs his focus to the Lord again. And again, it inspires him. And he gets up and he defeats Sisera and he defeats all of Sisera's men. Understand, encouragement toward godly resolve is not a once and done thing. It's not like, okay, I encourage you once, I'm done with you. You're on your own now. And that's why we need resolved presence. We need resolved presence. It's about being with one another in the midst of the battle. Maybe not on the same battlefield itself. Notice Deborah doesn't pick up a sword, enter onto the battlefield and start fighting herself. But on multiple occasions, her presence influences this other leader in the battle. This is the way of Jesus, by the way. 
Jesus did not encourage his people to obey from afar, did he? He didn't stay in heaven and call the shots and, and just kind of pull the levers from a distance. Jesus entered into the battle with his people. He came to earth to be the real flesh and blood presence of God with his people. In fact, Jesus went even further than Deborah could. As the Lord himself, he fought and won the decisive victory for us by dying on a cross and rising again. And then he, he promised his continued presence with his people by his spirit in the battles that would still remain. And the way that his spirit is with us is through the indwelling presence of the spirit in Christ's church. Not just through his indwelling of us as individuals, though that is important. But the picture that the Bible consistently gives is about spirit-filled people coming together to be a resolved presence for each other. Just like spirit-filled Deborah encouraged resolve in timid Barak to enter the battle, we need other spirit-filled believers to encourage resolve in us. And we need to encourage resolve in them. And that can only happen through the ministry of presence. It can only happen when we're committed to being with one another. And when we're present with each other, we can leverage gospel accountability to put sin to death. That's one of our goals for this series, that we would learn how to do that better. We can be honest with our fears and our sinful desires and our lack of motivation. And we can remind one another, the Lord is with you and he has delivered the battle over the powers of darkness into your hands. That's why we're so insistent on gospel communities here at Oak Hill. Because we are in a battle. When you go to your gospel community, you're not just going for some snacks. You're going to participate together in a battle. We need the resolved presence of other believers in our lives. I need my wife. I need the other elders. I need my gospel community. I need other pastors, not as my ultimate source of power, but as those who will remind me of my ultimate source of power. And so who is it for you? Who is it for you? Don't try to be a lone ranger Christian. You aren't above needing others in your fight against sin. If we're honest, there's a little bit of Barack in all of us. And trying to do the Christian life alone is going to lead you to be more like Heber the Kenite than Barack the general. Sitting on the sidelines, enjoying a peace treaty with God's sworn enemy, that's Heber. Now, speaking of Heber, we're now at the point in the story where his introduction becomes relevant. Look at verse 17. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to, the, said to him, Turn aside, my Lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk, by the way, that would have been warm goat's milk. All right? Mm, yeah. But it also will put you to sleep. And she gave him a drink, and she covered him up. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, is anyone here, say, no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, the, the wife of Heber took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him. Love that. She went softly to him. It's not about to be soft. And she drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. 
So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with the tent peg still in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin the king of Canaan before the people of Israel, and the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin the king of Canaan until they destroyed Jabin the king of Canaan. Okay, before we get into the next point, I couldn't help but share this uh, meme that Keith Martin sent me uh, at the beginning of this Judges series. Uh, So when I say I want a biblical wife... What people think I mean is that I want a passive, a wife who is passive and subservient. What I really mean is I want a wife who is totally willing to drive a tent peg through a tyrant's head should the opportunity arise. I told him this could also apply to raising biblical daughters, of which he has three. He eagerly took up that mantle. But in, uh, in reality, Jael is a celebrated woman in scriptures. And, and at first glance, her act seems sneaky. It seems treacherous. It seems terrible. But the Bible celebrates her. She, she gave Sisera what he deserved. See, biblical womanhood, while complementary to biblical manhood in nature, is anything but passive. And at the same time, uh, she wasn't always like that. At one point, she was passive. She, she needed something to push her in the direction of action. She lived in the house of Heber the Kenite, and their household had purposefully escaped the conflict to sit on the sidelines. But as Barak decimates the force, forces of Sisera's army, and as he chases down Sisera, she decides to join forces with Israel. And we see that your resolved per- persistence influences others to join forces in God's battle. Your resolved persistence influences others to join forces in God's battle. Now, Deborah had promised that God is going to deliver the hands into uh, deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. And we kind of expected at the beginning of the story that it's going to be Deborah, right? Like, she's the one who's influenced so much of the story so far. But here, God uses an even more unexpected character, the character of Jael. So she's, again, a woman. She's a Gentile. So she's not an Israelite, but a Kenite. She's descended from Moses' father-in-law. And her husband is in cahoots with Sisera, the enemy. And so to do what she does, she has to break all kinds of traditions and laws. Her activity would be so unexpected to a Jewish reader. First, she has to let a man enter her tent alone, which is a big cultural no-no. She basically seduces him. She has to go against her husband's decisions. She has to feign hospitality and be treacherous. That's one of the worst cultural traditions traditions if you're a Jew. And if all of that's not bad enough, she has to murder someone. Murder someone that she vowed to protect. And this is so unexpected. It's not what we would normally celebrate, but in the end, she gets on the right side of the battle, and that's what mattered. She gave Cicero what his sin deserved. And so I have to ask as I read this, Why now? Why now? Why does J.L. enter the battle now? Verse 17 says that there was a peace between Jabin and Heber. There was some sort of covenant between them, which meant that, that Sisera had likely been in this tent before. Some scholars even speculate that Heber is the one who tipped Sisera off to the fact that there were 10,000 troops about to attack him. And so why does Heber's wife, Jael, decide to attack now? And I believe that it is this. Because Barak had done such a thorough job in the battle, he he persistently pursued every last man. And the victory was so clear, she was forced to choose which side she was on. There was no more sitting on the sidelines at this point. It was time to choose sides before it was too late. And so her husband had made an evil choice. But now is her time to get on the right side of the battle. She took it. 
So I want you to track the flow of the story so far. Deborah's resolved presence influenced Barak to even enter the battle. Barak's persistence in the battle to chase down every last man influences Jael's resolve to join forces in God's battle. So it starts all the way back with the, the spirit-filled Deborah. Moves to Barak, now it moves to Jael. Resolve influences resolve like dominoes that are set up in a row. If you start the movement, they all start to move. Your resolve persistence influences others to join forces in God's battle. So we see this again in Jesus, right? He, he won the victory by enduring to the end. He persisted even through a cross and a grave. He defeated death. He himself in that moment crushed the head of our enemy, the serpent. He delivered the mortal wound. And he pursues him still today until the full number of his people are gathered in from all of the nations and are saved. And he's going to return and all of the enemies are going to be put under his feet. That's persistence. And Christ's persistence to the end demands that we choose sides. Like I said last week, the resurrection demands a response. And if it only affects one day per year, listen, if it only affects one day per week, then it's meaningless. It doesn't mean one thing to you. But if Jesus rose from the dead, and he has ascended and is returning, if he, if he left his spirit with us because the battle isn't over, then we must choose sides. The time is now. Eternity is at hand. Now is the time for you to choose sides and join forces in God's battle. And if you've been sitting on the sidelines, it's time to start fighting. You can't make peace with the enemy, with the prince of this world, and then consider yourself a follower of Jesus. It doesn't work. You can't stagnate forever and, and refuse to take the next steps of following Jesus and consider yourself a disciple. You are either for Jesus or against him. There is no middle ground. And if your version of the Christian life does not require godly resolve, I will say it again, it is not the Christian life that you are living. And if you need more resolve, listen, we totally understand, right? Look around you. We, we are a room full of imperfect people. There, there, but there are also so many people who are giving themselves wholeheartedly to Christ and his kingdom to build up his church. And if you haven't been around long enough to see that, I pray that you will. Let their persistent resolve influence your persistent resolve. Now, if you do find yourself fighting the battle with godly resolve, day after day, you're waging war with the sin in your life. You're, you're calling others over to the side of Jesus who's already had his victory over Satan then rest assured, your resolved persistence will influence others to join God's battle. It will. You might not see it right now, but it will. Your fight against your own sin is going to show, parents, it's going to show your kids what it looks like to confess and repent. Your, your vulnerability to open up in accountability will encourage others to do the same. Your, your willingness to apply the gospel when you see sin in someone else's lives to call them to repentance and faith. It's going to have an effect. You're proclaiming the gospel to an unbeliever you see bound in the kingdom of darkness can open their eyes. It can cause them to turn and see their deliverer in Jesus Christ. Not perfectly every time. There are times when people reject God and that's not on you but you have the opportunity to influence the people around you toward godly resolve. Your persistence in God's battle is a testimony of God's victory in your own life. And it's going to draw others in. In fact, it's important when we see God's victory in our lives that we learn how to tell that story. 
So as chapter four comes to a close, the battle is over. Jael has demonstrated that she has killed Barak. I'm sorry, killed Sisera. And so Deborah and Barak break out into a song of praise. In fact, they basically retell the whole story of chapter four again. And so we're going to go through chapter five very briefly. And, and we're just going to see how this retells the story in song form. Chapter 5, verse 1, Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly, bless the Lord. She's celebrating the resolved influence of the leaders and the resolve that the people took up to enter into the battle. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, to the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. So who's getting the glory for this? Not Barak, not Jael, the Lord. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled, the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. And so here she's using uh, imagery from Sinai and the Ten Commandments and how God's presence was so evident there and now it's so evident in this battle. It's suggesting that, that the way that the battle was won was that there was rain that poured down from heaven into this riverbed, this dry riverbed. It flooded, made it muddy, so, so Sisera's 900 chariots did him no good. That's awesome, God. That's awesome. Verse 6. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned and travelers kept to the byways. So now we're going back and we're describing what life was like under the rule of Jabin. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be, to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. When new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. So she's saying life was terrible. You you couldn't find a a weapon to save your life. There was no standing up against these chariots. And it's all because Israel had given over to idolatry. Tell of it, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, you who Walk by the way to the sound of the musicians at the watering places. There they repeat the righteous triumphs of the Lord, the righteous triumphs of his villages in Israel. So she's calling forth a future time to remember back and say, all of your peace, all of your victory goes back to this time of the battle. Remember it. Tell of it. Then down to the gates marched the people of the Lord. Awake, Awake, Deborah, awake, awake, break out in song. Arise, Barak, lead away your captives, O O son of Abinoam. Then down marched the remnant of the noble. The people of the Lord marched down for for me against the mighty. For Ephraim, from Ephraim, their root, they marched down into the valley, following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen. From Makur marched down the commanders, and from Zebulun, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. The princes of Issachar came with Deborah, and Issachar... Faithful to Barak, into the valley, they rushed at his heels. So, so far we have all of these uh, faithful people who responded to God's call, those who made up these 10,000 troops, right? But then we have some who chose to sit on the sidelines. Just listen to this list. Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. It's like, let me sit back a little while. Let me think about this. Maybe I'll get into the battle. Maybe I won't. Why did you sit still among the sheepfolds and hear the whistling for the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, and Dan, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his landings. So you have these tribes that didn't enter into the battle, and they're being exposed for that. Zebulun is a people... And now we're getting back into the battle. Zebulun is a people who risked their lives to the death. Naphtali, too, on the heights of the field. The kings came. They fought, then fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh. By the waters of Megiddo, they got no spoils of silver. From from heaven, the stars fought. So this is now going into the, the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places that are having battle behind this battle, right? 
From their courses, they fought against Sisera. Their, the torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon, march on my soul with might. So again, that's that river flood that's bugging, uh, mogging down the chariot wheels. Then loud beat, loud beat the horse's hoofs with galloping, galloping of his steeds. Curse Miraz, says the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants thoroughly because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. So again, we're, we're, we're talking now about uh, those who are sitting on the sidelines, not, not getting into the battle. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, of tent-dwelling women most blessed. He asked for water and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a noble's bowl. He sent she sent her hand to the tet peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. So gory and graphic. Between her feet, he sank. He fell. He lay still. Between her feet, he sank. He fell. Where he sank, he, there he fell. Dead. Out of the window, she peered. The mother of Sisera wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? The wisest princesses answer, indeed, she answers herself. Have they not found and divided the spoil, a womb or two for every man? Spoil of dyed materials for Sisera, spoil of dyed materials embroidered, two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as spoil. So the mother is saying, what's taking so long? Her handmaidens are, are saying, uh, uh, sister just won. He's just taking a while. Little did they know. Little did they know. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. And then we get the close of the cycle, and the land had rest for 40 years. So we aren't going to dig any deeper than that into these verses today, but they basically describe what happened in chapter 4 in more poetic terms. And what we see happens after resolve presence and resolve persistence have taken root is that resolve praise is the result. Your resolved praise influences others to remember God's battle. So when we come to a text like this, we should ask the question, why? Why, when we have all of chapter 4, do we need a whole other chapter to describe the same exact events all over again? And it's because of this. We need to remember God's battle. Israel kept entering into the cycles of sin, and they needed to remember that God had won their peace. As they were sitting comfortable in their palaces, at a later time, they needed to remember that God was the one who had won their rest. The time of peace that they were now experiencing was also their time of testing. The battle would come around again. And before they were tempted to join sides with the enemy again, they needed to remember the God who crushed those idol worshipers. They needed to remember the God who defeats every idol and that's why they're singing, so that Israel would remember God's battle. And not only that they should remember, but that they should lift their voices in praise. Notice that Deborah and Barak and, and even Shamgar and Jael are, are celebrated. But ultimately, God receives the glory. To him belongs the praise. See, praise through song uniquely helps us remember the battle is won by the Lord, even while the remnants of the battle are still raging. Our praise must be filled with the victory of Jesus. That's why we pick the songs that we do here at Oak Hill. It's not because they're the trendiest top 100 hits. It's not because they make us feel good. It's not because they make much of me, but because they make much of Jesus. They're not me-centered. They're Jesus-centered. They're about the one who, who lived and died and rose again to secure our victory. They're about his presence with us and his glory going before us. They're about the gospel. 
And like Deborah and Barak, we, we sing, we celebrate to remember God's battle. That's one of our goals for this series too, that we would learn to celebrate and, and, and celebrate the superior worth of the gospel in our lives to the cycles of sin. If we don't learn to celebrate, if we don't learn to praise, then our hearts are going to be drawn to idolatry of the culture around us. Praise for God's character. Praise for his work. Focuses our attention on the supreme worth of God and what he's done so that we don't go after other gods. Our hearts are are captivated in awe of who God is and what he's done. And then we build our lives upon his love for us. We, We follow him anywhere. And our praise doesn't just do that for our own hearts, right? It does that for the people around us. Sometimes we're we're so in the middle of the battle that the best that we can do is listen to the praise of others. And if you're there sometimes, listen, that's okay. Soak it in. Allow it to refresh your soul so that you can keep fighting the next week. And then, when you can, let your voice join in the song. Deborah and Barak's duet is recorded for all peoples, for all times, so that they will remember that God always wins his battles. And when we sing praise, the Bible says that we address one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs as we make melody to the Lord in our hearts. We're singing to God for the benefit of one another. And so I've asked this many times before, but, but I need to ask it again because it's, it's something we constantly have to remind ourselves of. How is your praise influencing the people around you? When we sing as a church, can people see how much you love Jesus and how much he has done for you? Are you willing in full voice to retell the story of Christ's victory through songs of praise again and again with his people? Praise is so important to breaking the cycles of sin. It is how we fight. We have to learn to celebrate God's victory so that we're ready to fight another day. And so that thing from the the beginning of the sermon that we had talked about, the thing that God is really calling you to do and you just don't really want to do. How would you rate your resolve on the resolve meter right now? If you're really resolved, great. Let others in on that. Be contagious to the people around you. Invite them in. Tell people what God has called you to do and and, and invite them in with you. Give God praise to the people with the people around you. And if you're like, yeah, I'm not feeling resolved right now. I'm I'm just not feeling it so much. Can I encourage you in this? This is your next step. Admit that to someone. Admit that to someone. Like Barack went to Deborah, go to someone in your gospel community and say, I know God wants me to take my next step of following Jesus. But I'm really hesitant. Name the thing that's holding you back. And then ask that person, would you go with me in this? Would you pray with me? Would you be a resolved presence in my life? Would you hold me accountable? Would you encourage me? Listen, we all need that for each other. We all need that at times. Maybe you're like JL and you've, you've tried to live life on the sidelines, but today you're seeing it's time to get in the battle. Turn to Jesus and see his victory. Submit yourself to the Spirit and get on his side. If you want to talk to somebody about that, I am more than happy to talk to you about that. And then praise. Praise. We should all be praising because he has won the victory and he will win the battle. Fill this room with songs of victory in your lives. 
Thank you for listening to Oak Hill Fellowship Church. Stay connected with us by finding us on social media or by joining us Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Until then, remember that you are loved.